Hello, everyone. Welcome to One Two Church. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Come through loud and clear. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gary Shirley. Um, my wife and I have been coming here for a little over a year now, uh, maybe a, a year and a few months. Pastor Matt kind of touched on this last week for a little bit when he was speaking. And he had mentioned that his vision for this church was that uh, when people walked in the door here and came to this church for the first time, that uh, they felt the presence of God and that they felt the Holy Spirit move within them. They felt the touch of the Holy Spirit. And I can only tell you from our personal experience, and I think Melissa will back me up on this, is that that's how we felt the first time we came here. And uh, it's a powerful thing. This church is a powerful thing, and uh, we love this congregation for that. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together this morning to worship you, to study your word, for the fellowship with each other, and for the fellowship with you. We know you're present. Your word tells us that whenever two or more of us are gathered together in your name, you're with us. You're here. We feel that presence, dear God, and we appreciate that and we thank you for it. Please open our hearts and minds today. As we study your word, please let us know what, to, what you would want us to take away from this message. Bless the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So yeah, it's kind of hard to be in a bad mood this morning, right? We woke up in paradise here, beautiful morning, it's gorgeous outside. This afternoon when it gets hot, we may not be in quite as good a mood, but we're all in a good mood right now, right? So we'll capitalize on that. Uh, like I said, most of have been coming here a little over a year now. Um, we really fell in love with this congregation, with this church, and what was happening here. Once we started coming here, they haven't been able to get rid of us since. <laughs> um, I don't know that they've tried, but yeah, we, we certainly keep coming back, so that's a good thing. Um, one of the great things about this congregation, about this group of believers, which I think is an amazing group of believers, is that we have managed to make some incredible friends over the last year and a few months. And uh, friends will happen to us in our lives. And that's really important, right? That fellowship with other believers. Um, and by the way, Y'all notice I don't have any notes up here. I got my Bible up here. I got my Bible app open on the phone, but I don't really have any notes. I had three pages of notes typed out. A couple days ago, I walked up and threw them away because I suck at reading notes. So this is going to be a lot better for me. We're going to rely on the Holy Spirit to, to hopefully give me the words that will make some sense. So, so any prayers, I will appreciate. Thank you. Um, so we're flying solo. We got no notes. We got no notes. So. Um, one of the great things about having this group of friends, this group of believers here, is a few months ago, a couple months ago, we had a lot of our, or a few of our friends, church friends over, good friends of ours, and we had dinner. And after dinner, we're sitting around the table, and one of my friends is an ex-military man. And um, he's telling a story of when he served, I believe it was in Iraq or Afghanistan, somewhere in the Middle East. He's telling the story about... Uh, one of the details he was on was basically a bomb squad, right? I think it was explosive ordnance detail, right? You know, a bomb squad, the, the troops are moving through an area, they go out, they, you know, they encounter some sort of homemade IED, you know, a homemade bomb from the enemy that they used to kind of disrupt troop movements. They would call out my friend's team. He would go out there to this spot. One of the guys had to put on the, put on the bomb suit and then dismantle this bomb, right? Dismantle this homemade explosive ordnance. And so I think maybe everybody knows the suit that I'm talking about, the bomb suit. It's like in popular culture that we've all seen some depiction of it, right? Me personally, I think maybe the most accurate depiction was a movie about Hurt Locker about 15 years ago or so. You know, that big gummy looking suit they put on that protects them in case, in case the bomb goes off, right? That's, that's the protection. And so he's going through this description of this suit that they put on, and it's really detailed. I'm a little bit of a nerd. It's probably not true. I'm a lot of a nerd, right? So I'm soaking up this, this description like a sponge, man. He's telling me about this thing, how this suit, the exterior of the suit is the flame retardant fabric, right? Bomb goes off, got a huge fireball, I want to make sure the occupant doesn't catch on fire. Next layer was uh, the really kind of space age insulation they had in there, really lightweight, but really intense insulation, so that the person inside the suit doesn't get burned. Yeah. Told about the uh, like the Kevlar or carbon fiber panels that all around the suit to protect all the bodies so that no shrapnel would perforate the suit. Right? And then one of the things he told me that was really really interesting to me, and y'all may not find it as interesting, was that there was this like titanium or magnesium, some kind of um, you know like a lightweight alloy framework that went through the suit almost like a skeleton, right? 
But how would the whole suit together? Because if you think about it, you're out there dismantling a bomb and it, it goes off, you know, something goes wrong and it goes off. That percussive blast wants to pull everything apart. And if it starts pulling that suit apart, if, if the appendage of one of those appendages of that suit comes off, the person inside, their appendage is probably going with it. That's a bad day, right? We don't want that happen. So I was listening to this description, and it goes through how, you know, the, the protection goes from the sole of your feet all the way up to the top of your head. The big helmet they have on has that visor. It's like bulletproof glass, you know, some kind of acrylic or polymer that can see through, but still it protects them from shrapnel. It's just an amazing description of the suit that they wore. And uh, several things struck me as he's telling me this description. The first one is, and I warned you I'm a bit of a nerd, is that my friend is a superhero. Because all I'm hearing is full on Tony Stark Iron Man, right? And that's all I picture in my head. So the nerd in me comes out, that's the first thing that I think of, right? The second thing I think of is that no matter how hard I try, from now until the day I die, I will never be able to appreciate enough what the men and women of our military go through on a daily basis. Right? Do you think you have a stressful job? It's 120 degrees out, you gotta put on this big bulky suit, you gotta make a decision of which wire to cut in this homemade bomb, and if you make the wrong decision, it's gonna blow up. Whew. Every time I say my job has stress, I just think about that, but no, I'm there. But the third thing that struck me, and probably the most important thing, Terry, can we get the first slide? Is how much it reminded me of this passage in Ephesians. This passage in Ephesians. <laughs> 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may, be able to stand, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. That's powerful, man. Put on the full armor of God. So as I'm sitting here listening to that description from my friend, it's, it, it hits me, that it reminds me of this, this whole passage about the armor of God. And one of the things that really hits me is that one component of that suit of armor is worthless unless you have all components on, right? If my friend in the bomb squad goes out there and they decide they're not gonna wear the helmet, they got on everything else, something goes wrong, guess what? That, that's bad news, right? Or if you decide, hey, I'm not gonna put on the hat, or the, the boots, I'm not gonna put on the gloves, all those components have to work together for it to be effective. And Paul's telling us the same thing. Now, I want to give us a little bit of background on this. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, right? This is the book of Ephesians. By the way, in researching this sermon, i got to tell you, I kind of fell in love with the book of Ephesians. If you haven't read it, you should. It's a short book. It's only six chapters. It's really a great book. It was written in 60 or 70 AD when Paul wrote this. It applies just as well to 2023 AD as it did in 60 or 70 AD. Yeah. Because he's telling this church at Ephesus that, hey, listen, you're involved in a spiritual battle. There is spiritual warfare going on. And not only is he instructing them, but he's encouraging them. To my mind, in reading through the book of Ephesians, I find this to be Paul's most encouraging letter to believers. Um, and it's really something to read because then when you transplant it into this day and age, you read it and it applies so heavily to what we go through today. Because like it or not, we are involved in a spiritual battle, right? We're involved in a spiritual warfare. <clears throat> Every Sunday when we walk outside these doors, we're involved in a spiritual battle all week long. If you don't believe me, just open up your phone, look at your social media feed, or open up a, uh, open up a news website, look at that, turn on your TV, um, open up a newspaper. Are newspapers still a thing? <laughs> All the young people are looking at me going, what's a newspaper? <laughs> we used to get the news on a piece of paper. I know it's weird. But, uh, I'm showing my age once again. Um, and if we, can we go to the next slide? Paul wants to make sure that this church in Ephesus understands that he's talking about a spiritual battle because Paul brings up this put on the full armor of God twice. He does it in verse 11, does it again in verse 13. So it's so important that he brings it up twice. I just started at verse 13 because I don't want to be too redundant. But in the verse before that, in verse 12, Paul says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul wants to make sure that these guys don't misunderstand this. I'm not talking about sending you out in a physical battle. I'm talking about sending you out in a spiritual battle. 
It's so important to him that he says it twice and he makes sure it puts this disclaimer in the middle. So we're talking about a spiritual battle. Now I want you to think back about the time that Paul was writing this. You can add to the long list of things I am not. Historian, I am not a historian, right? But I'm pretty sure this was close to the peak of the Roman Empire, around 60 or 70 AD. And what Paul would have reference to for suit of armor is what you would see the Roman centurions wear. Because everybody, and we've all seen in popular culture, right, the movies, the Roman centurions, they had the big brass helmets with the little, you know, comb thing up on top, the big brass breastplates, the high leather boots. I mean, we all, we all know that image, right? Terry, can we get the next slide? So Paul starts out his description of the suit of armor with, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, in that description of that armor of the Roman centurion at the peak of the Roman Empire, the absolute apex of uh, military armament technology at the time, did you picture a belt? I did not. I'm like, Paul, why would you start out with a belt? I don't see a belt anywhere in that image that I portray in my head. So Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the only thing that I can tell you is that there are some of us who are going to need a lot more truth to fit around our waist than others, okay? I'm hoping I get some extra truth, maybe with a couple extra buckles, so after lunch today I can loosen that up, kind of like expand the belt, right? That's the kind of, that's the kind of truth I need a lot of. The buckled around your waist. I can also tell you that as you get older, the location of your waist changes. Too. <laughs> Everybody hear that, right? Those of us who are, you know, in a certain age range, and it's amazing for men. The amazing thing is our, our waist starts out down here in our 20s and ends up up here. It's a unified graphic. So that's, that's a pretty amazing thing in and of itself. But I think what we can all agree is that the waist is kind of pretty much the center of your body, right? At least that's where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be kind of in the middle. So I believe what Paul is telling us here is if we can keep the truth at the center of our life, that's a really good start to our suit of armor, right? Keep the truth to the center of our life. Well, what is the truth? I can tell you that over the last five to ten years, I've noticed that our society, our popular culture, truth has been a big discussion, right? I mean, we're kind of like forced to believe that we're told that the truth has somehow become subjective. I have my truth, you have your truth, they have their truth, somebody over there has a whole completely different truth. And then we all have different truths. And as interesting a notion as that is, I don't think it's real, right? I don't think that's right. The truth is still objective. There is truth and there is lie. There's not a whole lot of gray area in between. Now we kid ourselves and we tell white lies, right? We all tell white lies and I'm doing my taxes. I'm like, hey, you know what? If I don't claim this little bit of income here, that's not really a lie, right? Like, yes, it is. And by the way, if the IRS is listening right now, that was strictly a hypothetical scenario only for illustrative purposes, okay? Make sure the NSA got that on tape. Um, don't white lines. When I get done today, I'm going to jump off the stage. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully step off the stage, not fall off the stage. And my wife's going to go, gosh, Gary, that was a great sermon. All your jokes were awesome. Right? That's white line. Right? That's, that's the little white lines we tell ourselves. The unfortunate thing is there's still lies, right? There's still truth and there's still lie. What does the Bible tell us truth is? Terry, can I get the next slide? Thank you. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. If Jesus tells me he's the truth, I'll nod my head in agreement on that. And what I think, what I believe is that Paul is telling us, keep Jesus at the center of our lives, right? If our belt is worn around the center of our body, keep Jesus at the center of our lives. That's the first part of our, of our armor, spiritual armor. Terry, can I get the next slide? And the second half of verse 14 says, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. I want you to go back to that image that you had of that centurion, that Roman centurion, right? They had that big, huge brass breastplate, easy for me to say, that went from 
their neck all the way down to their waist. Kind of curved around the sides of the rib cage, had that heavy leather in the back and cinched it down with. It protected the torso because that's where its vital organs are, are, are housed, right? If a soldier took a wound or somehow, you know, took a, took a wound into the vital area, the vital uh, organs, a soldier probably couldn't get up and fight anymore. We're probably going to lose it. Same thing with the head. So the largest piece of armor they had was that breastplate. What does Paul tell us that our largest piece of armor should be? Righteousness. Wow. But that's kind of a, that, that term is kind of mysterious to me. We know God is righteous. We know Jesus was righteous. But Paul's saying we need to have righteousness to be part of our armor. What is righteousness? It's making that choice whenever we're faced with it, that decision to do the right thing, to do the morally right thing, right? To do what God would want us to do. Sometimes we make those choices a dozen times a day, right? We're faced with those different decisions. Maybe sometimes a hundred times a day, maybe sometimes a thousand times a day, depending on the day. We're all always faced with those little choices, those, those ability to make that decision of right or wrong. And righteousness is nothing more than making that series of right, of right decisions. Now listen, we're humans, right? Sometimes we're going to make the wrong decision. Sometimes we do it inadvertently. We don't even know we made the wrong decision until much farther down the line. Maybe months, years later, we realize we hurt ourselves or we hurt somebody else. And then we realize that, oh man, we made the wrong decision. Other times, we decide to do the wrong thing because we're disobedient. We just want to do it, right? I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. It doesn't matter what God wants to do. I'm going to do this and we're disobedient. Praise God that we worship a loving and forgiving God who gives us a path to salvation to cover those sins, to atone for those sins. Because we are human, and sometimes we're not going to make the righteous decision. But Paul tells us that, hey, keep Jesus at the center of your life, right? And then use righteousness as the largest piece of your spiritual armor. Just choose to do the right thing over and over. Those are the first two pieces. Terry, can we get the next slide? Thank you. Then Paul goes on to say, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Ready for the gospel of peace. And Paul says this when he's talking about our feet because of movement, right? He wants us to be able to move. We're not, we're not given this coat of spiritual armor, this suit of armor to just stay in one spot, to hunker down in our houses and our bunker, wait for attack, right? We're supposed to be moving out through the world, through that spiritual battlefield with the gospel of peace, spreading the gospel of peace. That's what we're given it for. What is the gospel of peace, man? To me, that starts at John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise God, you want a gospel of peace. There's a gospel of peace right there, right? Funny thing, my grandmother told me when I was probably <laughs> six or seven, because I was so amazed how much she could recite scripture and verse, right? She knew all these Bible verses. And I was like, Grandma, will I ever be able to memorize all of those? And she was like, don't worry about that. I've, I've been studying the Bible for, for decades. It's really important to me. That's why I remember them. If you're only going to want to remember one verse, remember John 3.16. Okay, well, here 55 years later, over a half a century later. Well, that boggles my mind. Boggles my mind, trust me. Here in 55 years later, I can still recite that from the King James Version, you know, all 25 or 26 words. Of it. I used to remember how many words there were, but I, I, I think it's 25 or 26 in the King James Version. I would argue the most important 25 or 26 words in the history of humanity. It's that important. That's the gospel of peace. That's our salvation. That's And by the way, if you've never read the Bible cover to cover, Spoiler alert, it just gave you the whole story of those 25 or 26 words. That's how important that verse is. Terry, can we have the next slide? I love this verse too, because if you're going to talk about the gospel of peace, Matthew 22, uh, Matthew 22, 37 through 39, I, can, I, can I paraphrase this? Does anybody mind? Love God, love others. Right? That's what this verse tells us. Love God, love others. And by the way, 
That would be an awesome mission statement for a church one of these days. If anybody wants to use that in the future, feel free. Just say, put it out there. Love God, love others. That's our gospel of peace. Why would we not be ready to move forward and share that gospel with others? Why would we want to keep our lamp under a bushel? Why would we not want to be out there screaming this at the top of our lungs everywhere we can? And the answer is, there is no reason, right? We have this great story of salvation that sometimes we're afraid to share. Um, Terry, can we get the next slide? And so Paul goes on into verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows, arrows of the evil. The shield of faith. Now, one thing we didn't mention in that, that suit of armor was the shield. You know, the, the centuries, they always had that shield left there on their arm, big, huge chunk of, I think, wood with brass on the outside. <clears throat> Paul tells us that in our suit of spiritual armor, our faith is so important that it will stop an attack before it ever reaches my suit of armor. Right? Somebody said that shield can extinguish the flaming arrows of an attack before it ever reaches my suit of armor. Man, how important does that make faith? Profoundly important, right? All right, and I'm glad I don't have my notes with me because I'm going to go off a little bit of a tangent and tell you a story. I promise you it will bring up a point at some point. But you're going to have to hear it. Also, in this story, no animals were harmed in the telling of the story. I'm looking at this table right in front of me. No animals get harmed. I am driving to church last week, coming in from Laguna Vista. I go through Laguna Heights. I'm coming up to Port Isabel. Traffic is, you know, bumps up to 55 miles an hour. There. Traffic is starting to get heavy because it's a beautiful Sunday. There's a lot of people headed to the beach. You know, it's hot. People from the valley want to come down here. 8.30 in the morning, man, there's a lot of traffic. Going this way, going eastbound, the direction that I'm going, I'm here. There's at least four or five cars in front of me, another three or four in the right lane next to me. I know for sure there are two cars right in front of me, two cars right in the lane to the right of me, and everybody's only a couple car lengths apart, right? Suddenly, from my left-hand side, a coyote comes flying across the highway, weaves right in between the four cars in front of me, and goes flying off into the, uh, the bushes over there in the, in the wildlife refuge side. He obviously had found a rabbit or a mouse or something, some kind of food source he was just laser focused on. Now folks, I've been around a lot of coyotes. I grew up on a ranch in Missouri County. Though. I grew up on a ranch. I've never seen a coyote move this fast in my life. Once again, showing my age, does anybody remember the old Roadrunner cartoons? Yes. <laughs> All of a sudden people stuck their hands up. I can tell you, if Wiley Coyote had it been that fast, that would have been a one episode of the series. <laughs> so he would have caught the roadrunner right at the start and been over, right? This coyote was flying. <clears throat> and uh, to add to the list of things I am not, I am not a theologian. I don't know that animals have guardian angels, but you would have a hard time convincing me that, that coyote did not when I saw him levitate through those four cars at 55 miles an hour. It was pretty impressive, i got to tell you. That's why I'm telling you the story. And it made me think, well, it made me think of a couple things. First thing is, am I the only one who prays periodically for my guardian angel? Because, man, I have put that thing through some overtime. Every now and then I'll just pray to God, man, please get my guardian angel, you know, a raise, a couple extra days of PTO, a bonus, something. Because unfortunately, I've made a murder. And that's just in the times that I know about. So as I watched this coyote fly across the highway, dodging in and out of traffic that really he had no business avoiding, completely oblivious to the dangers around him, so laser focused, he had tunnel vision on whatever it was he was going to get. I was reminded how many times in my life I had that tunnel vision. I was so laser focused on something of this world, whether it was career, money, acquiring things, relationship, whatever it was, man, I was so laser focused on it, and I put it ahead of God, right? Every now and then, or well, maybe a lot of times, we do that, right? We put things ahead of God, and that's, all that is is idolatry, right? You know that. In fact, I think Matt, Matt spoke about that last week. I thought about all those times when I put myself in that position, and I had that tunnel vision, and I was oblivious to the dangers around me, both spiritually and physically, and yet, my shield of faith, God kept me safe. 
I know that because I'm still here physically and spiritually in one piece. The physically part is maybe a little rough around the edges, but spiritually, I'm still here in one piece. Because that shield of faith is so powerful, that's what, that's what we use to keep us safe. So that if there's attack, spiritual attack, it stops it before it ever reaches my suit of armor. That's a powerful thing. How powerful is faith? And one other thing I'll add to that is that even though I wasn't being faithful to God, he was being faithful to me, right? He was keeping me faithful even though I was chasing after some, some sort of idol. I put something ahead of him, and I was not being faithful to him, but he was still faithful to me and protecting me. And in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Our God is so faithful. He's more faithful I know that I can never be, and I would assume more faithful than anyone can. He's faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to him. Terry, can I get the next slide? Thank you. In Matthew 17, 20, he talks about how important faith is. Because how important is faith? Faith is so important that with the faith of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to move from there to there. I want you to think about that for a second. That's a whole lot of movement, right? You get a mountain to move from there to there based on that little tiny amount of faith. Man, faith is that important to people. If y'all have ever seen a mustard seed, it's about the size of the head of a pen. What Jesus is telling us is that that's all the faith you need, just that little bit of faith and you can move now. Terry, can I get the next slide? Thank you. Luke tells the great story of the penitent thief on the cross, right? Remember, there were two thieves on the crosses next to Jesus as he was being crucified. And the, one, the one thief mocked Jesus. The other one defended him, and the other one, I mean, obviously, these guys were aware of who Jesus was. Jesus had made a name for himself in those three years of his ministry, and obviously they knew who he was. And as he hung on the cross, as they all three hung on the cross, the penitent thief understood that he was guilty, that Jesus was innocent. And he said to Jesus, he had enough faith, and he had heard enough of Jesus, he had enough faith to say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. That's how important faith is. That thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus had enough faith just to say, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. And that saved him. That's how important faith is. Terry, can I get the next slide? As Paul goes into chapter 7, or verse 17 here, he starts to kind of sum up the suit of armor. He says, take the helmet of salvation. How important that salvation is the thing that we keep wrapped around our head, where our brain is, where our thoughts are, where our tongue is, from where we speak. That Paul says, keep that helmet of salvation around your head. Because Paul's telling us here that we should keep salvation at the top of our thoughts, right? That's where salvation should reside, at the top of our thoughts, because we are saved by a loving and forgiving God. And also at the tip of our tongue, because we should be ready to share it. We should be ready to share that gospel of peace. We can't do that unless that salvation story is right there at the tip of our tongue. So Paul's saying, wear that helmet of salvation. And the part that I love the most, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because Paul has told us all the way up to this time, that here's this defensive armor, right? I'm going to give you this armor that spiritually you can't be hurt. It's going to protect you, right? But here at the end, Paul tells us that we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I told you earlier I'm a nerd, right? A little bit of a nerd, maybe a lot of a nerd. I was like, cool, man, we get a sword. That's pretty cool, all right? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I can tell you all that um, nothing has helped my spiritual life or improved my life overall more than taking a little bit of time each day to spend in the Word of God. And listen, I'm not talking about a lot of time. I probably average 15 or 20 minutes a day. First thing in the morning when I get a cup of coffee, I read the Bible. Nothing has done more to improve my spiritual life or my life in general more than spending that little bit of time with the Word of God each day. It's that powerful. And I implore you, if you don't currently do that, 
spend a few minutes every morning. Some mornings, I only read a couple verses, right? I'm busy, I've got other stuff to do. I'll read a couple verses, a little bit of a prayer, and I'm done. Some mornings I may have more time and I may, may read a couple chapters. Some mornings I may read an entire book, like Ephesians, it's only six chapters. But man, spending that little bit of time every day makes incredible difference in your life. I can tell you that I've made that commitment to myself many times before. Would start to do that, right? I'd do it for a couple of weeks and then I'd stop. Kind of like going to the gym, right? You start, you do it for a couple of weeks, oh, this is great, and then you stop. I made the commitment to myself about nine months ago, and it has been amazing the difference that it has made. So I highly implore you to do that. So Paul gives us this suit of armor, right? He describes the spiritual suit of armor, and then he gives us this weapon of the Spirit and the Word of God, not so that we can stay in one place like we talked about before. We're not supposed to hunker down in a bunker at home and just wait for spiritual attacks. That's not what we're given this for. We're given this so we can move forward on the spiritual battlefield in that spiritual war and be able to fight the fight, right? To be able to go out there and witness the glory of Christ, to be able to go out there and spread the gospel to all the corners of the world, all the nations, all the people, just like the Great Commission tells us to do, right? We're not told to just sit back and wait for attack. We're told to be bold, not to be timid. Folks, I gotta tell you, for 40 years, I was timid. I was afraid to go out and spread the gospel of Christ because I was afraid I might offend somebody. That's, that's timidity, that's not boldness. I was afraid to go out and give people the great news of the gospel. And that's just, that's not right, right? That was 40 years I kept my lamp under a bushel. In fact, I would say in that 40 years that I professed to be a Christian, if you'd asked people who worked around me or knew me, if I was a Christian, they would probably go, well, I don't know. I mean, that's how bad I was at not being able to spread the gospel of Christ. Paul is telling us here that we don't have to be like that. Paul is telling us that we can be bold, that we can go out and spread the gospel, and that we should be out spreading the gospel. I was so afraid that I was going to offend a non-believer that I was afraid to spread the gospel. Another quick kind of story. Is everybody here familiar with the, um, the magician's pen and teller? You all know who pen and teller are. Ken Gillette is the tall dude, does all the talking. Teller is the little short guy, is always quiet. That's kind of their shtick, right? You know, Teller never says anything. So Ken Gillette is uh, an about atheist. And a uh, very intelligent guy. Very funny, too. And uh, he came out with a book a couple years ago. And although I have not read the book, I saw some of his interviews as he was doing his uh, promotional tour, right? And so one of the things he talks about is his atheism and how he never got offended by Christians coming up to him and trying to, as he quoted it, proselytize, I call it witnessing the gospel. He never got offended by people coming up to him because he thought that if we know the answer, if we believe that he's going to spend his eternity in a lake of fire, and we know the answer for him, we know how he can be saved from that, why would we not share that with him? He saw no reason to be offended by Christians doing that. But in the next statement, he implies that the reason he is still an atheist is because so few Christians do. Let that thing sink in for a minute. That hit me hard because I was that person who was afraid to witness the gospel to non-believers because, because I was afraid I'd offend somebody. He bolstered his atheism by our lack of ability to witness the glory of Christ. Man. That really made me stop and take a look back at myself that, okay, listen, I can't be that timid. I have to be bold. I can't be that guy who is so afraid to do that that he keeps his lamp under a bush. Like, I can't be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that is out there witnessing for Christ and telling the gospel. In fact, Paul kind of goes on to say that himself in 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. So that I will fearlessly make known 
the mystery of the gospel. In 20, he goes on to say, for which I am an ambassador in chains, Paul was in prison at the time. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly. He uses the word fearlessly twice. It's that important to me. Don't be timid. People, as I should. Paul's asking for the same thing for himself that I'm asking for myself here now. God, please make me bold enough that I can go out there and express to people just how important this gospel of peace is. Because we can't afford not to, right? We're given the great commission to go out there and spread the gospel. We need to be able to do that. And I know I personally have failed at that. I don't want to be that guy anymore. I want to be the person who succeeds at that. That's how important it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your word this morning. Dear God, we pray that you would make us bold and not timid. Um, make us fearless in spreading the word of Christ and spreading the word of yours and spreading the gospel of Christ. Dear Lord, give us that strength to be fearless. Thank you so much for giving us your word to study this morning. And please look after us as we go out this week. Give us the opportunity to spread your word and give us the ability to do it. In the blessed name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.